Hello there, welcome to Brian Lomax Movie Talk. And yeah, my ranking video of all my patrons' favourite movies, at least the ones that were willing to participate. So uh, for my patrons, I have a Facebook group uh, just, just, for, just for patrons. And in that group, I basically put out the call to say, look, I'm going to be doing this patrons week. Uh, I want to do a ranking video of all of your favourite movies. If, if you would like to take part, just, you know, leave, leave your favourite movie in the comments section and there you go. So I've got 12 uh, that, that, yeah, gave me their favourite movie uh, that are, I guess, willing to compete, take part. It's not a competition. Look, uh, the thing is, there are some films on here I don't like. That is not a reflection in any way of my love for the person who, who, whose, whose favourite movie it is. Um, and this is just subjective opinion. And it's also, when it comes down to it, just a bit of fun. Uh, that's the main, the main reason for doing it. And just to, just to give something back to my patrons. Although, as I say, the, the patrons whose movies are at the bottom of this list will, will, yeah, may not be my patrons for much longer. <laughs> so this, this may have been a bad idea. But, uh, but yeah, there you go. Uh, it's just a bit of fun. Uh, that's what... That's what happened. That's the reason this video came about. Um, there's 12 films on this list in total. I'm going to start with my least favourite and work my way to what I think is the best. Um, so let's go. And number 12. We've got Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Uh, I was looking forward to revisiting this. I saw this way back in my teenage years. I remember really liking it. I remember finding it quite hilarious to be honest um, and haven't seen it since uh, until Glenn Parson uh, I'm sorry Glenn so, yeah this is his favorite film apparently uh, this is this is what he says I, I, I watched it this time around I so desperately wanted to like it I thought I would I really did and I just didn't I don't like most of the characters in it I find a lot of the situations and what the characters do to be pretty I don't know, it's just a lot of reprobates. We're just following a lot of reprobates. And then the film takes a really dark turn into an abortion storyline that is kind of just done. It's like, it's so matter of fact, the way these teenagers just decide to have an abortion. And then it's never spoke of again after that. And it was just, yeah. Not, not for me. Next up at number 11 is Carl Massey's choice. Uh, this is Limelight, the Charlie Chaplin film. I was really looking forward to this. I've seen a couple of Chaplin movies, although not, not quite all the way through. But what I've seen of them, like City Lights, I saw the first half hour of, and I was really impressed with the, the creativity from Chaplin on, on that. Um, and The Kid I saw way back when, years ago, I, I really don't remember much of it, but I do remember really liking it. Um, so yeah, I was looking forward to getting to this. It was about time I got stuck into a bit more Chaplin. Um, I kind of found this a little bit overrated. Uh, obviously I'm in the minority there because this does have a pretty impressive score on the likes of Letterboxd and uh, IMDb and all those kind of places. So this is clearly a movie lover's film for the most part it seems to be uh but i i did find it a little bit overrated um i didn't find there to be the kind of physical creativity that i've seen from chaplin in the few bits that you know that i have seen of him uh, and i get that this is primarily a film about someone who's dried up washed up their, their their talent has kind of gone by the wayside so they're just not funny anymore um but there are literally long scenes, long sequences in this film where we get to see that he ain't funny. And, and, and it, yeah, it, it does drag in places. The film is two hours and 20 minutes long, thereabouts. Pretty long for what it is. Uh, but the main thing is that it is overly melodramatic, like really overly melodramatic. Uh, for, for me, I don't mind a bit of melodrama. I think um, a melodrama is, 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 you know, it's the staple of Hollywood cinema. It's been it's been there since the dawn of cinema. Um, 
but I, th I think there is a certain way to use it. I think here it kind of, it takes away from uh, some of the more, what would be some of the more touching moments of the film, um, just because, like I say, it, it, it's often overplayed, uh, particularly by the, the woman that's in it. I forget her name, uh, Claire something, I don't know, uh, could be wrong on that. Uh, but she, yeah, there's, there's times in that film where I just, I just kind of, she grates on my nerves a bit uh, because she's reduced to tears at the drop of a hat and it's like her go-to, yeah, and, and she's so hysterical. It's just like, oh, okay. Other than that, the story that the film follows along, the characters and all that kind of thing, their journeys, I really liked. I thought I thought that was that was pretty, you know, a pretty good story uh, is, is, is what I would say, but maybe not the best execution. Chaplin on... Directing, writing, producing, uh, music composing, starring it. Yeah, very much a man of many talents. He's he's pulling a lot of strings on this film. Uh, but yeah, I, I it's good film for me, but it's not a great film. Uh, but yeah, like I say, I'm in the minority on that one and I know it. And number 10 is Gone with the Wind. This is Mary Whiteside's choice. Uh, I did see this. I've seen this twice, I think. I saw it when I was in school and I saw it a couple of years ago. It, it's overly long for me. And again, that melodrama does creep in. Uh, but I think the melodrama in this works a lot more than it does for, say, a film like Limelight. And that's primarily because of the epic scale. It's a grand look at America, you know? So we have a lot of those open road, wide shot vistas and, and, and beautiful colours and I just feel like the landscape plays into that melodrama a lot more because, again, the, the scope of it is so big and so epic, it feels like it's not misplaced. Whereas with Limelight, most of it is in a room, you know, it's, it's in, this, it's in the, the character that Chaplin plays, it's in his room on a bed for much of the time, so when that melodrama creeps in it just it over overpowers it, whereas, like I say, we've gone with the wind, it feels a bit more suitable. However, the film is a bit too long for me, uh, and definitely dated. Certain racial aspects of the film just would not fly today, uh, with good reason. Um, and I find one of the main characters, the, the character played by is it Vivian Lee, I think I've... Again, doing crap with the names today. It could be Vivian Lee, it might not be. For some reason, I feel like it's Vivian Lee. Um, her character is annoying throughout. Uh, I, I, I don't really want the two main characters to get together, really, because, yeah, I, I, I don't really like her character. So when we get to the famous, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, I'm kind of like, good on you, mate. Should have got there faster but um yeah other than that it's 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 a good film it's a classic um but i'm not going to rush back to it anytime soon just because yeah it's not something you can just jump on and and, and yeah kill kill a couple of hours no you, you kind of need to take a whole day in order to do it and Quite frankly, for that running time, I, there are other films I would rather go to. At number nine, we've got The Princess Bride. Uh, this is Eobard Thorne's choice. Uh, now, I'm using, obviously, that's not his real name. That is a reference to the Flash villain. Um, but that's what he calls himself on social media. I do know his real name, but I don't want to give it out here just in case... Just in case that he, that's the reason he doesn't choose to use his real name on social media. So, for, for the sake of this video... We're going to call him Eobard Thorne, uh, but yeah, he knows who he is. Uh, his, his, uh, so his choice is The Princess Bride. Really good comedy, solid film. I, I, it is one that I feel maybe gets a little bit too much praise. Um, it's, it's not one that I will revisit again and again. I've seen it. I'm happy that I've seen it. There were many parts in it that I did laugh at, but I can think of other comedies that I would rather watch. Um, but... No, beyond that, it, it is. I get why it's a comedy classic, I guess. But the but I've never really been the comedy guy. That's not my go-to genre. I've said that before on my channel. Um, but yeah, as far as comedies go, it is a good one, and I do like the fantasy element as well. Big fan of fantasy films, that kind of thing. So yeah, not really much more to say 
than that. Other than Kerry Elvez, who I'm sure I've just butchered his name, um, I'm I'm not really keen on him as an actor, and yet here he does some brilliant work. He's really funny in this film, and I think that's the key with him. I think he's suited to comedy. Um, I don't think he's suited to serious dramatic performances. And number eight is Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, and this is James K. Richter's uh, choice. And I've said many times before on my channel, I do find this first Star Wars film to be... See, I don't want to use the word overrated because I get why it had the success that it did. There was pretty much nothing like it around at the time. Um, and I do appreciate the world that Lucas built with it. I just feel like Star Wars really came into its own when Lucas wasn't behind the director's chair. I wasn't behind the camera. Um, I wasn't sitting in the director's chair, I should say. Um, I, I just, yeah, I, I think he knows how to craft a story, like plotting, you know, plot points, that kind of thing. But I don't think he knows how to write dialogue. I certainly don't think he knows how to direct actors. And I do think this film plays much better to kids or people who were kids when they saw it and fell in love with it and therefore have the nostalgia factor. That kind of isn't me. Um, yeah, first half an hour drags for me, really does. And I find the ending to be a little bit anticlimactic when you see two old guys fighting with lightsabers. Like I say, much better stuff, much better handled once we get to Empire Strikes Back, which is a lot darker, a lot more impressively directed by someone who knows how to get emotion out of actors, elicit that, you know, the desired response. So yeah, it's still a very fun, creative film that clearly had a huge impact on the industry, uh, but it's just never been quite my cup of tea in the way that it is with a lot of other people. And number seven is Master and Commander. This is the favorite film of Jason Knight. Um, I really like this film. I've, I've seen it a couple of times. I think some of the battle sequences it are, are really incredible. Um, you know, when you think of high seas battles, galleons, pirate ships, that kind of thing, you know, trying to think of films that, that have, a lot of them are, are pretty old, to be honest. Uh, this, this, it's directed by Peter Weir, who is one of my favourite directors, actually. He made uh, Truman Show, one of my favourite movies. Um, but he does a really good job with the period detail and the authenticity of all, all, all that's involved in it. Uh, but no, I, I like the characters. Um, I, I think it's a shame it never got a sequel, to be honest. I think it would have been a good series. I know it's based on a series of books, so certainly if it had been successful, although I think it was pretty successful. Uh, so I, again, I don't know why this didn't get a sequel, because best of my knowledge it did do pretty well um but yeah great relationship between all central characters i like these people when we lose some of them overboard i, I genuinely feel that um so yeah i just it's very well directed the drama is great and there's a joke in the film that russell crowe's character tells which which always made me laugh the first time i heard it the thing about the the lesser of two weevils um i don't know immature i guess but yeah, makes me laugh. Uh, it's a good film. Yeah, very good film. I really like it. Um, so good choice. And number six is The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. And this is the choice of Graham Davison, otherwise known as Man V Film, otherwise known as my cohort, partner in crime on the Brits on Flicks podcast. Um, I hadn't seen this film, uh, I thought, at all, um, until watching it recently for, for this video. And then when we got to the last 20 minutes, I was like, I've seen this. I've either seen this when I was younger and completely forgotten about it, or I walked in when my dad was watching it or something and ended up seeing the ending. I don't know what, but uh, yeah. Suffice to say, it's a good film. It's a very good film. I'm still not overly keen on the way that Sergio Leone's movies are, are dubbed. Because obviously, I mean, a lot of that I think was budgetary con uh, constraints, things like that. But uh, yeah, they'd shoot everything outside and then come back and redub it in the in the studio or whatever. But it, it always kind of puts me off a little bit. Uh, but certainly with regards to what he does with a camera and the way he stages things, he was, yeah, absolutely a master 
of his craft. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great Western, what can I say? Uh, really kind of dubious characters in it that you can't help but fall in love with, despite the fact that they do some pretty heinous things. Uh, and, you know, even the good in this, you know, the, the three three main characters, the good, the bad and the ugly, even the good is maybe not so good, really. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's it's fun. It's, it's I enjoy the ride. And as, as a person who enjoys a good Western, this is definitely up there. I'm not sure it's my favourite Western from Leone, though. I think it is the, the best of the trilogy, the uh, the Dollars trilogy. But I think I would actually rate Once Upon a Time in the West over this. Uh, but uh, but no, it's, st it's still up there. I can still understand why somebody would go for this one. But I think I'd prefer just, just that, yeah, that other film. At number five, we've got Predator. This is one of the first videos... I ever rented, or one of the first films I ever rented on video, and yeah, I I have very fond memories of it as a child. It it just opened up my worldview of what an action movie could do and be, and yeah, uh, maybe kickstarted my love of science fiction along with Terminator, of course. Um, but yeah, it's it's a five star film, uh, as are all the films from this point on. It's a great action film, it's a great horror film, it's a great sci-fi film, it's one of the best Arnie movies, uh, and it's just, yeah, it's it's a simple, simple concept. Bunch of soldiers in the jungle being hunted by an alien. That's it, you know, you can write it on the back of a postage stamp, but it's executed with absolute brilliance from director John McTiernan, who also made Die Hard, obviously, uh, one, of the, one of the great action directors, it must be said. Um, but yeah, absolute classic, and I love the design, love Stan Winston's design of The Predator. It's just brilliant. At number four is John Carpenter's The Thing. This is a Jordan Moran's pick. It was a nearly another patron's pick as well, but they went with something else in instead. Um, but yeah, Jordan Moran went with The Thing, and I can understand why. Uh, yeah, I only saw this film in the, in, in, in the last couple of years, um, reviewed it with Graham over on our Brits on Flicks podcast. It's a brilliant film. Uh, Graham actually got me the, the special Arrow release version of it, so I'm, I'm really chuffed with that. That sits pride of place in my collection. Um, yeah, it's just a great film about paranoia, which was really greatly riffed on in the X-Files as well. It must be said, one of my favourite X-Files episodes, but yeah. It's it's a great performance from Kurt Russell. I love the character dynamics. I love the little injections of of things into the script, into the characters that just key you into who these people are. Simple things, um, and it's got a great ending. I love kind of downbeat endings um, that aren't totally flushed down the toilet, so to speak. There is possibility that these guys could survive at the end, but it, it leaves you with that. Leaves it with it, with it with it hanging, basically. The special effects are absolutely incredible. The practical work that is done, some really monstrous creations. Um, and yeah, as a viewer, it just helps to feed your paranoia whilst watching it. That you, know, you, you kind of buy into the paranoia of these characters and just the fact that any one of them could be the thing, uh, which again, when, when you see it, when it reveals itself, is truly terrifying. I remember seeing the spider head scene when I was little, and I, I think I'd, I'd walked in on my mum and dad watching it or something, or I, I'd, I'd, I'd sat down to watch it with them or something like that. I can't remember, but I do have a vivid memory of when I was a kid, seeing that sequence and thinking, nope, not for me, and I was out. And I hadn't seen it since until, like I say, a couple of years ago when I watched it and was like, this is awesome. And number three is Christopher Nolan's The Prestige. A brilliant movie that I did not appreciate fully the first time I watched it. I was actually a bit disappointed the first time I watched it. The ending kind of it was a bit of a side swipe. Wasn't where I thought it was going at all. I felt like I'd had the rug pulled from under me and not in a good way. Uh, but it was only after I kept thinking about it and, you know, looking at the narrative and how it relates to the narrative of a magic trick and realising that, you know, that 
yeah, story narrative is very similar. Film narrative is very similar. They have these, these formulas and that's what Christopher Nolan is playing with. That's what he's kind of analyzing, so to speak. Um, and beyond that, it's just a really brilliant character study of these two men who are both obsessed, incredibly obsessed. And that obsession is destroying both of them from, from within and without. Uh, so yeah, brilliant film absolute masterpiece. And number two is David Fincher's Fight Club. This is Jack Petrie's choice. Um, I'm not going to say too much on this because I am kind of halfway through or semi-way through a David Fincher series of reviews on my channel. I do want to get through all his movies. Suffice to say it's brilliant. Uh, as I've already said, five-star movies, so that'll give the game away for when I do that review. Uh, but it is. It's a five-star movie. It's absolutely brilliant. The themes it deals with, uh, you know, are very relevant even today. You look at consumerist society and just that overload of consumerism is just weighing us down, uh, turning our homes into Ike Ikea catalogues that actually do nothing for us but destroy our souls. Yeah, you know, I, I know that's a bit of a, an overstatement, but roughly that's where the film's going. And I just love the way that the central character, Tyler Durden, kind of brings out in this this other central character, the narrator, brings out something that wasn't there, this life. But it, it just, yeah, makes him alive, uh, but only by confronting him with death, so to speak. Uh, yeah, take it taking people to the end of the road so that they can realize what they have and, and what it's really all about. And yeah, again, that's a, it's a very, I'm just trying to be really sketchy on it because I don't want to get deep into it until I get to my review, but brilliant film. I will leave it at that. Which just leaves my number one choice, uh, which is CP's choice, actually, Willy Screedia. Uh, he went with Inception. Another Christopher Nolan film. Anyone who knows me knows I'm a huge Christopher Nolan fan. The Dark Knight trilogy is my favorite trilogy. The Dark Knight being my favorite movie of all time. Uh, yeah, in my top 20 movies of all time, you will find, I think, something close to five, maybe six Christopher Nolan films. Uh, this being one of them. Um, Inception is just stellar. It really is. It's beautifully plotted, really intricate. Um, it's very complex and very complicated, but not in a way that loses you. You know, if, you, if you're paying attention, if you stay engaged, you, you can keep up with what's going on. But uh, yeah, it just, it boggles my mind that this film, this story could come out of someone's mind. Um, and it just makes me appreciate Nolan all the more. It's just a, a, a masterpiece of science fiction. Uh, DiCaprio doing great work. All, all the actors in this actually, it's got a really great cast. Morgan Freeman, Tom Hardy, Killian Murphy, uh, Marion Cotillard, uh, just, yeah, the list goes on, Michael Caine, just all doing incredible work. Um, the film is a very long film, but you don't feel that running time. I don't feel that running time anyway, because I'm just always engaged with what's going on. And some of the visuals, just, amazing uh yeah like the, the the zero gravity fight scene it's not quite zero gravity is it it's yeah you, you know what i mean that fight scene and just the, the the thing it does with time slowing down and the you know the the dream within a dream within a dream it's all it's just handled brilliantly put this in the wrong hands and this film would have just been a mess um but thankfully christopher nolan boom so there you go. That is my ranking of all my current patrons' favourite movies. The ones that wanted to take part at any rate. Um, again, do have to reiterate my, my apologies particularly to, to Glyn Parsons. Sorry, mate. I, I, I know you, your film kind of ended up right at rock bottom. I still love you. I hope you still love me. I hope uh, that doesn't, yeah. I hope that doesn't dissuade you from supporting me in the future. Um, it, it was just a bit of fun, and like I say, it is all just subjective, and I know I talk out on my backside a lot of the time. So, yeah, um, but there you go. If you think you would like to take part in this, maybe next year, if I decide to do it, why not go and check out my Patreon page and see, see what you can get into. Uh, but, yeah, all that remains for me to say is a huge thank you to my patrons, uh, past and present, 
it really does make what I do feel a bit more rewarding uh, because it, 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 you know, when somebody's willing to do that to support someone like that, it just, it, yeah, it just, it makes me feel like what I'm doing actually matters to someone, that they care enough to want to do that. So yeah, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for your support, whether it's past, present, or, you know, future. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and thank you to anyone watching this video. Please do leave your thoughts down below about the way you think I've ranked these. How would you rank them? Uh, do let people know what you thought of their favorite choices. And until next time, cracking.